astrology night at Soul Food Book, Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. This is the first Wednesday night of the month, the first Wednesday night of every month. Jeff Jower and me, I'm Rick Levine. We're here to talk about the cosmos and in the month ahead, this for the record is July, June. What month is it, Jeff? It's still June. It's still June. You know, Jeff and I write columns and dailies and weeklies and we've written yearlies. And one of the things that happens to us as opposed to you is that we know where we are, but sometimes we don't know when we are. Because we've just written about something maybe three months in advance and or just a week in advance and and so sometimes we get confused it is it is june it it is june and we are here at soul food for those of you who are uh here for the first time how many are here for the first time one two three, all right four, five, six. all right well there's not enough of you to to, to explain so <laughs> What we're going to be talking about as we do the first Wednesday of every month is to talk about the collective planetary patterns for the month ahead. This is the cosmic weather. This is the cosmic weather report that affects all of us, but in different ways. Each one of you has an individual birth chart, and the material that we're talking about tonight is not about your birth chart. It's about the bigger pool in which we are all swimming, right? So Rick and I are gonna talk about the month of June collectively for 40, 45 minutes or so. Then we will take a short break. And then after the break, we will select three people's charts to take a look at. We'll do little mini readings of less than five minutes a piece to show you what real astrology looks like in uh, hopefully not too humiliating and embarrassing uh, form. That's humiliating. Well, hopefully, us. I'm say, hopefully right. not. Right. We don't care about. Yeah. 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 Right. And you said uh, the the weather that we're all swimming in. And I'd like to start off with the thought that this month actually we move into a little bit more of a swimming kind of a scenario. Um, we, we in astrology, air is about thoughts, feel, feeling, uh, I'm sorry, thoughts and, and about movement. And water is about feeling. And we have the sun for at least the first two thirds of this month. We have the sun in Gemini, which is air. It's about thought. And we've had Mars forever, it seems like, in Libra, which is air, which is also about the thought. It's about, it's about communication and about it, relationship, you know, thought that happens that's shared in relationship. But we have a pattern this month where we're moving a little bit more into water, and I just want to put that out there so that when we actually go there, we can kind of recollect that this is, I think, a little bit of the pattern. Right. So we're going to start, and of course that's a constant with astrology, in that the sun, the dominant force in consciousness and energy in the solar system, is in one sign, usually for about the first three weeks of the month, and then the last ten days or so, there's another sign. So our transition, as Rick pointed out, this month is from 21 days of jumpy, jittery, mental, communicative, airy, free-floating Gemini, and then about nine or ten days of taking things very personally with cancer. <laughs> However, However, at the moment, we're getting ready to do a kind of weird reversal. Now what's happening is that this month, on the 7th of June, just three days from now, Mercury, the planet of communication and the planet that is associated with Gemini, stops and begins moving backwards. It begins its thrice annual retrograde cycle. Now we'll talk about what that retrograde means in a bit. But what's particularly interesting is that Mercury, the planet of intellect, is right now in Cancer, a sign of feeling. And what that means is we're likely to be thinking with our feelings. That is, that our thoughts, which are always to some degree colored by emotion, are perhaps colored even more by emotion now. 
it may even be difficult to tell which is which because the line between thinking and feeling, I think, or I feel, is being blurred this month. So the dance that we're all doing is not just the annual airy thinking Gemini to emotional security conscious cancer, but we're getting it on another level this month. And I think the, the practice, the work that we have ahead of us is to recognize where feelings blend into intellect. That is, when we're saying something, not because it's rational for us, but because it's irrational, because it's, a, because it's emotional. And at the same time, this is also an opportunity for us this month to also articulate our emotions, perhaps more skillfully than we usually do. So I would like to backtrack a week ago when we had a new moon in Gemini and Mercury was in Gemini along with that new moon. So we had this intellectual, mental uh, buzz, restlessness, a feeling that Gemini can be quite agitated even because it doesn't like to stay still. And so on the 28th, one week ago, we had a new moon in Gemini and on that day Mercury moved from Gemini into Cancer, kind of like a scout. Because even though the sun was, would still be in Gemini all the way through the 21st of this month, Mercury now is moving ahead of the sun. And as Mercury, there's going to be other motion as I do this, but just pay attention to the sun and Mercury here. Because as Mercury gets ahead of the sun, you know, it's, it's like if you're looking at your house from the, a distance and someone is in your yard, you always know that if you look towards your house, you're going to see the person in your yard because they, they're not going to be far away from it. Well, from the Earth's point of view, the sun is far away and Mercury goes around the sun. So Mercury never gets far away from the sun. And when it gets as far as it can away from the sun, it looks like it slows down and it's because the Mercury is going around the sun like this. That's why Mercury looks like it goes retrograde. So what happened is that Mercury moved ahead into Cancer, but as Jeff said, it slowed down, and on the 7th it began turning backwards, and you'll watch over the days ahead how Mercury actually backs into the Sun, moves back into Gemini, even though the Sun is now in Cancer, and we're, I just wanted to show graphically that we're doing this flip between thoughts and feelings. And, and this pattern of flipping around is not only appropriate because of Mercury retrograde, but because the sun's in Gemini. And because the cancer holds back even that, too. Right. But, but Gemini is a sign of duality. It's a sign of right. multiplicity. Right. It's called the sign of the twins. But if there were only two in every Gemini you knew, they would be pretty darn lonely. There's a whole army of ideas, of energies, of perspectives, uh, symbol symbolized in the sign of Gemini. And as Rick pointed out, we had the new moon in Gemini, the sun and the moon joined together every lunar month, every 28 days or so, to begin their own monthly cycle. The new moon in Gemini near the end of May was a seed point to a four-week cycle. And it's a seed point in Gemini, the sign of communication which could, should, perhaps means new ideas, new connections, new perspectives. But at that new moon, Neptune, the planet of illusion, confusion, diffusion, compassion, was making a precise right angle. That's the big fat red line. And right angles are called squares and they represent contrast or tension. So while the new moon in Gemini is, I'm going to go learn a new language. I'm going to study something new. I'm going to, you know, flirt with everybody in the neighborhood. In your dreams. Here, I, I, thought, I, I thought you said you'd turn his mic down. Um, but Neptune square, or in a right angle to, to Gemini, to this new moon in Gemini, is saying, you know, there's a place of indescribable feeling or quality of diffuse emotion that cannot be fit into the intellectual and the rational box 
that Gemini likes. Gemini is really not about understanding things. Gemini is just simply naming things. As we talk almost every year, the telephone is a perfect example of Gemini. It's totally indifferent to the quality of the nature of the conversation. In fact, that old saying, don't shoot the messenger, is really, Mercury is the messenger. It doesn't have substance, so to speak, it just carries the data, like a telephone. So Gemini, as Mercury's sign, um, indicates, or should I say the new moon, indicates that we're dealing with this kind of difference between, let me think about it, let me talk about it, let me get clear, let me explain it to you. Oh, you don't understand me? Oh, do I not understand me? Did I leave something out? And while confusion is certainly a potential downside of this particular pattern, what it is, is a reminder to listen to the silence between the words and between the thoughts. That the, the things that we're talking about are not the essence of who we are. That in that space between your thoughts and between your words, there's, there's an almost infinite universe of connection and feeling. Because words and Gemini paradoxically connect. Hi, I'm Jeff. How do you do? Hi, I'm Jeff. How do you do? How do you do? And in one sense, we're connected. But in another sense, I've identified myself as not you. As being someone apart. That's what air energy is about. It's the intellect which operates by separating ourselves from others and from the object at hand. And yet I think because of this Mercury retrograde, which we'll dig into more deeply, and this particular new moon, we're sort of in this place between feeling and thought and going back and forth between the two. So, bringing us up to now, um, you, you know, yesterday, today, tomorrow, we have Mercury that is extended far, far from the sun as it's going to get, slowing down from our point of view. The planets don't stop. They just look like they do from Earth's point of view against the backdrop of the stars. And then it will begin creeping backwards, into, actually for the entire rest of the month. This entire month, even with other planets going into watery signs and a watery emphasis that I'm going to talk about more in a bit, even with that, the key to the month is really Mercury retrograde. Astrologically, you can go online, actually you can go online non-astrologically, you can go online and look up Mercury retrograde and you will find hundreds of articles and people's writings that are fear-mongering about don't do this when Mercury is retrograde, don't sign contracts, don't take trips, things will mess up, things will fall apart. Well, Jeff and I joke about this and that is things fall apart all the time. You know, it, it's like it, you don't need a Mercury retrograde to get you know, your luggage lost or to send an email to a wrong person or whatever, or to take a right when you should have taken a left. These are classic Mercury retrograde kind of things, but there's a deeper truth here. And what happens is during the retrograde, a planet gets closer to Earth and it gets louder. And so when Mercury gets louder and gets more intense, Mercury is the messenger of the, of the heavens, Mercury is the communicator planet, when there's more communication going on, it's like rush hour. It's the freeways get, you know, get jammed. It's the bridges get so filled with traffic that a bridge can collapse. Wires have so much data going across them that they can heat up and fray. So it's true that the symptom can be that communication gets messed up. It only happens when you're not paying attention to keeping the data moving and to building the infrastructure to keep those bridges strong and the wires intact. <coughs> yeah, I think that's a very important point and maybe the most important thing for you to take home from tonight's talk. And that is... They can't take it home, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> We're not in Taurus anymore. Oh, um, but we can all take it home. And 
that's the idea. And, and someone asked me when I came in tonight about Mercury retrograde, because as Rick pointed out, so much of the astrological literature is that all of the mercurial things, communications, details, maintenance, connections, that they're going to get messed up. Now, whether that's statistically true or not, nobody knows. No, but the two biggest, largest scale internet outages, boom, in one moment, both happened on the day that Mercury went stationary uh, retrograde. So there is something behind it. I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing it. I don't know what the statistics are. But well, there may and, be something and, and nobody does. But, but, but the point is this. If you use astrology to limit yourself in life, get away from astrology. Don't even bother using it. So agreed. Because it's not the little things that really will make the difference in your life. It's the larger patterns. If you're in tune with yourself, if you're in rhythm, if you're in harmony with yourself, and you want to buy a car during Mercury retrograde, it will probably work out just fine. If, however, you're nervous about getting a car, you really can't afford it, you're unsure, you have mixed emotions, other patterns are going on in your life which are destabilizing, even under the best of astrological conditions, it's possible that you'll buy a lemon. Well, and, and actually one of the scenarios, as long as you're talking about buying a car, is you wake up one morning and you think, you know what, my old car is falling apart, it's about time I got one, I'm going to start looking. And you drive around and you pass a lot and they have a purple something there and you go, purple, my favorite color, and you go in and you go, look at it, that looks good, and you buy it. it it's, it's that feeling like there's no time to process and doing something without, without, without really taking the time. Yes, we can make bad mistakes when Mercury is retrograde if we feel a sense of urgency that's not based upon the facts, but that's more based upon this, uh, oh, this, oh my God, I better do it right now, that's purple, I won't see another purple car. You get the car home and you realize, shit, it doesn't have a back seat. <laughs> what am I gonna do with my kid? You know, or whatever. Because we just don't think things through sometimes. Yeah, and, and if there is some useful advice for Mercury retrograde, it is to think things through. Yeah. The count to 10 rule. Right, or, Go inside. Reflect. Just reflect. Have you ever um, said, you know, boy, I wish I had a chance to do that again? Whether it was a good experience that you want to repeat, whether it's a negative experience you would like to have avoided. Well, when planets go retrograde, they're going back to where they were. So during this rest of the month, essentially, while Mercury is retrograde, it's really an opportunity to think back over the previous few weeks, to think about the decisions that you've made, to think about the ideas that you've developed, and it gives you a chance to reframe them and reflect upon them. All the RE words tend to work well with Mercury retrograde. Review, reflect, reconsider. And this, and, and this, rather than being problematic, oh my God, I can't do anything, think of it as an opportunity to deepen your mind, to double the information, to increase the experience that you have so that you can make wiser choices. And with this Mercury retrograde, it starts out in Cancer. We're going to talk in a moment. I think we have a couple of other things on the way to it actually retrograding back into Gemini. But, but with this Mercury retrograde in Cancer, it's not only about, re I mean, I agree with you that it's moving backward, we get a chance to rethink, to re to, to reimagine what could have been, or we get to often revisit old experiences. Someone from the past may come back into our life. We're moving backward in time, intellectually, in a way. And because this isn't a feeling sign, there's that sense, again, of where we can't push forward just because we think we should push forward. We may, in fact, do best by allowing that tide or that backwash to take us back a bit without fighting it. Even though we think we have a deadline, we think we need to finish something, it may just take a little bit more time. And like Jeff said, you know, if we go with that, we actually can utilize this to reconsider, rethink, and actually then get to places that we may never have gotten to as it turns around and goes direct in July. 
Now, we have another planet that's going retrograde this month, but I don't know if we can even tell. It's Neptune. And Neptune is so diffuse um, and so non-material that Neptune going retrograde isn't likely to be a noticeable event. It occurs on June the 9th. And when I say it occurs, as Rick often points out, when planets turn retrograde, they're like on a pendulum, which sort of stops before it, before it shifts directions. So although Neptune technically stops on June 9th, the principles of ideals, dreams, spirituality, and imagination with which Neptune is associated are going to be in a retrograde or backward cycle for about four months. And I think the interesting thing here is that Neptune is in her or its own sign of Pisces, Mer water sign, Mercury, which is already turning retrograde, going deeper in thought, but where in a watery, emotionally sensitive Cancer, and on the day that Neptune turns retrograde, the moon, along with Saturn for a couple of years stand, but the moon is also in water sign. And so we have this kind of watery grand trine, if you will. Uh, it's five degrees off, but it's still, it's humming in water. There's planets in each of the water signs. And so there may be that sense of that, 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 that subtleness of, of, of uh, Neptune at least playing a little bit deeper in, in our imagination and our feelings. Yeah, well this raises an interesting issue. What Rick talked about was a grand trine. A trine's an angle of 120 degrees, the most free-flowing relationship any two planets can have. And when we have three of them, such as Neptune, Mercury, and the Moon, that's called a grand trine. And astrological tradition considers this to be a wonderful thing. Whoops. Well, a big, harmonious, energetic hug. But sometimes the big, harmonious, energetic hug allows us to become babies, allows us to sort of grow passive. So while the negative side of this, or the potential here, is falling back into emotional patterns. Oh, Neptune, which can be the savior or the victim, Mercury and whiny Cancer, sorry Cancers out there, you know of whom I speak, um, and we like wine, but Mercury and Cancer, and then the Moon in, in Scorpio, which is like deeply committed to discontent, can, can really create a pattern of justifying victimhood, woundedness, they don't understand me. Now, what's the factor that's going to make a difference between this being a, a justified pity party or a real time of emotional understanding? Your choice. It's your choice. That's the point of astrology is to say, look, we're at a pivot point here in which you can go deeper into your emotions, you can look at the darkest parts of your personal history, that would be Moon and Scorpio, talk yourself with a little Mercury and Cancer, make yourself some, some nice tea, come here, buy a cookie, and then forgive, which is Neptune's, which is Neptune's potential. Or, again, there is Always, under the best of conditions, a grand trine could be like being a spoiled child. Well, they don't understand me. I'm going to wall myself off. My cats and I are going to have a very happy life because that's the only one who understands me. So, your choice. The prisons that we make are usually prisons of the mind. I mean, other some things people that I want to just bring up before we move on to, I think, the full moon. Is, is on the way here, um, a few days away. Yeah. But the two things I want to talk about are, one is I want to talk about a trine between Venus in Taurus, trining Pluto, and over the ensuing week, it moving on and opposing Saturn. These, the reason why these are important, I mean, they'd be important aspects no matter what, but Venus, is this is her own sign. 
So Venus likes, she likes the simplicity of Taurus. She likes the sensuality. I don't mean the sexuality. She likes the, the, the yumminess of, 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 of the feeling of, of, of nice towels and sheets and linens and food and wine and music and the senses. And so Venus in Taurus, which likes simplicity, gets a little bit of a surprise over the next few days. And we're feeling this already now as Venus moves into a trine with Pluto which is not about simplicity, it's about the complexity of going deep. Pluto is, is about things that are hidden. And here, these two planets have a very positive relationship, and so we can get something out of it. I think Venus becomes enriched uh, by the presence of Pluto if we're willing to step out of our comfort zone. Yeah, because Venus in Taurus, as Rick pointed out, Venus, the planet of love and attraction in her earthy home sign of Taurus, is really sensual and simple. And As what, Jeff sometimes says, when the going gets tough for a Taurus, just bring him a sandwich. That's right. That's what we like. <laughs> and we can look at this in a couple of ways. This simplicity, again, and sensuality of Venus and Taurus is very nice. What Pluto, the lord of the underworld, and a planet of power, passion, and transformation in ambitious Capricorn is saying, Okay, what do you want to do with your good looks? What do you want to do with your talent? What do you want to do with the extra money you have in the bank? What do you want to do with a relationship that's okay, but a little bit sleepy? So this gives us an opportunity to take something that's already good in your life. Something that makes you happy, that's Venus and Taurus, and to invest more in it so that you get more out of it. The other side of this is also Pluto, the big bad wolf, the planet of, of, of death and rebirths, trying to Venus can also mean if you're worried about what's going to happen, whether it's your own death, whether it's a loss of a relationship, whether it's a loss of a job, a loss of something, maybe that Venus in Taurus is a reminder to say, you know, just enjoy what you have right here, right now. The future is going to come regardless of what you do about it and if you can bring to that loss of job, relationship, belief, whatever it is, if you can bring some sense of joy and pleasure that you have in the moment, your recovery period is likely to be that much quicker if you do suffer a loss. So four days from here, we will have a full moon. We'll get there in just a moment. And Venus will be exactly opposite Saturn which is a very different story than we're telling right now. But I'm just putting that out there. But on the way, we have another little issue. We have this, I'd say sweet, but it's almost sweet because it's, there's a word, it's, it's a sweet sinful aspect. Dark chocolate. Dark, thank you. Dark chocolate and red wine that's so, so thick you can stand up a fork in it. Okay. So, so we have this with Venus to Pluto. But at the same time, we have developing this to Pluto. And this is Mars. Remember, Mars went retrograde um, uh, back in the beginning of March. And so Mars has moved through Libra. And as it did, it opposed Uranus and squared Pluto, the Uranus-Pluto square, which we're not going to talk about a whole lot this month because we've been talking about it for two years and we'll be talking about it for another year. It's still in play. It's only three degrees, 12, 13, 14, 15 from being exact, but it's kind of eased off a little bit. But Mars, which moved through Libra and then retrograded back, and then around that April 20th period of time during the Grand Square, uh, Mars was square to Pluto and opposite Uranus on the same day that Jupiter was square Uranus and opposite Pluto. That was a big day. But now Mars is going direct through those points again for the third and final time, which I think stirs up a lot of those conflicts, even though there aren't as many planets involved and the energies aren't quite as tightly wired, I think this is the place where we actually get to make something happen from all this. Yeah, Mars, the first planet outside the Earth's orbit around the Sun is the planet of action, assertion, aggression, initiative, and muscles. Mars is Venus's counterpart, and Mars has been in Libra, where it's got a smile, 
You know, it's like taking somebody right out of a combat zone and then putting them in a tuxedo and expecting them to behave very, very well. Mars and, and normally Mars only spends like what? Seven uh, weeks. Seven in weeks sign. in the sign, including a place where it's uncomfortable like Libra. This time it's spent uh, eight, seven, months. eight months. Eight months. Mars is kind of feral. You know, it's kind of, kind of this raw animalistic energy, and yet it's wearing the tuxedo in Libra. It's got to be polite and nice and smile at you. And Rick is quite right that Mars, now going forward in Libra, will, will these red lines show it's making a tense right angle to transformational Pluto. On the 14th. And coming into an opposition to revolutionary uh, Uranus. On the 25th. Right. So these are periods of time in which things, intense things, could be triggered. Because Mars is a trigger. Mars is the ignition in your car. And it is in Libra. So sort of like Mars square Pluto can be the kind of thing where you're talking to an authority figure, hissing at them through your teeth, just wanting to kill those a-holes who are ruining your life. But because Mars is in Libra, there's no blood allowed on the floor. Now that doesn't make the interaction any less intense. Sounds like a fine opportunity for the asshole whisperer. It, 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 it definitely does. So the point is this. In a positive sense, Mars, the action planet, square to Pluto, says, I know what I'm getting rid of because I know what I desire the most. Pluto is passion and power and desire. Mars to Pluto says, oh, okay, I really want this and I'm willing to give up this to get it. And then Mars' opposition to Uranus is like, I need to be free. If you catch yourself rationalizing your anger or your frustration, then you're, then all you're doing is stocking up the unexpressed anger or frustration to explode externally as an event, to explode at some other time in your life, or to be held permanently in your organs to take power away from you, to politely engage and intelligently engage conflict or negotiation, because if you're a Libra, just negotiating is a conflict. Because you're supposed to just go along and make the other person happy. So this, I think, is maybe more important than, than we might expect, because it's, it's the punch for the event that happened last in April, and it's coming around again. Yeah, and it didn't just happen in April. Obviously, this is an event that you know, it, it, it's like the, the nightmare that won't go away on some level. And, that's, and it's not necessarily bad. This can actually give us the, the opportunity to do those things that we may have put off and put off again, and now we get to that point where we realize that we really need to do it, it our, our survival. Mars, Pluto often is about survival. Our survival depends on it. This is our chance to make it happen. Now, over the next couple of days from here, we move closer and closer to the um, full moon, which I will get up here. Yeah, we're on the 12th, and I'm just getting that as close as I can there. That's close enough, 22 degrees. And, and you can see here that the moon in Sagittarius is opposite the sun in Gemini. Two weeks prior, we had a new moon in Gemini, and now we have a full moon in the sign opposite Gemini, um, opposite the sun in Gemini, which creates this awareness between the polarity of Gemini, the communication between two people, between, between your own thoughts that are going on, between data that you're receiving, and the communication that goes outward and creates philosophies and big ideas. Yeah, Mercury, ha I'm sorry, Gemini has to do with, Rick pointed out, near range communication and small pieces of concrete, although sometimes elegant thought. Sagittarius, the opposite sign, represents philosophy, far away vision, far away ideas. So, this one thing on the Sagittarius full moon, there's an enormous opportunity to have a breakthrough, as well as a breakdown, but mostly a breakthrough, insofar as. The Sun in Gemini is collecting data. Sagittarius can represent meaning. 
And full moons can be times of illumination. So it might be that you're buzzing around about a particular issue or set of issues, the full moon comes along and you go, oh, that's what it is. So pull your, if you find yourself peddling and not getting anywhere, pull your nose out of the issue. Go for a walk, enjoy some of Washington State's nature and legal substances of mind alteration, <laughs> including coffee uh, and tea, and, and give yourself room to have more wisdom than you think you have. And although we normally gauge the, the uh, sense of a lunation, a new moon or a full moon, by the aspects that the new moon or full moon creates, this full moon is different because the most significant aspects are not aspects happening to the moon itself, but in fact, and we talked about this earlier, on the day of the full moon, we have Venus opposite Pluto, and we, Saturn. I'm sorry, Venus opposite Saturn, thank you, Jeff, and we still have the remnants of Mars, or coming to Mars, squaring to Pluto. And so that, that this changes the flavor of this moon. Ye yes, I agree with you, breakthroughs are important, the walk in the woods is important, especially if we need to be alone, because Venus opposing Saturn often confronts the sense of limitation in relationship. There's a sense of, of, of feelings that are not going where you want them to or feeling like you're not being recognized. Then there's often a sense of, is this relationship even worth it? And, and, and it's not a good day to make a final decision. It's a good day to do the heavy thinking around the issues. Yeah, I think that's well put. There's confinement with Saturn's opposition to Venus. Confinement in love, money, self-worth, validation. Unless you've really been working stead steadily, and that can be a time of getting the stamp, getting your master's degree, getting the recognition. But normally, that's a socially intense aspect, which, with a full moon, I mean, pop culture knows full moon's a period of times where emotions tend to boil over. And werewolves. And, right, and it's very easy, I believe, with that full moon in Sagittarius, to imagine ourselves outside of the situation that we're in. Running away from it would be perhaps the less useful side. Stepping away far enough to see it in a wider perspective would be, I think, more desirable. And then on the 17th, the retrograding Mercury backs into Gemini just a few days before the Sun moves forward into Cancer. This again is that, it's that flip. It's the juxtaposition of thoughts and emotions. Yeah, and it can certainly manifest itself in the kinds of weird conversations where one person is talking about facts and the other person is talking about feelings. Or when internally you're sort of in that interesting place of trying to rationalize Mercury and factual Gemini. All right, let me restate my case here. Let me be clear with you. Let me explain how I got into the situation that the sun in Cancer is going, I just don't feel so good here. I just need to feel with it. And if that's not complicated enough, we also have Venus moving into Gemini Venus, which is about the feelings. Venus is about our aesthetic sense. It's what we like, it's what we don't like. It's not necessarily, um, it's not the only aspect of our emotions, but it's the aspect of our emotions that is the reaction to what we want or like and what we don't like. And when Venus moves into Gemini, those become a little headier issues. They're more mental, thoughtful. Yeah, the positive side of that is being more flexible in our values. Yes, and, and being able to discuss love and relationships with Venus, the love planet, in Chatty Gemini. But again, it's the same thing where here we've got the son of will and consciousness in Cancer. Just hold me. Don't talk. Just hold me. But darling, let me tell you about my day. Let me tell well tell me what's going on with you. I really want to understand. Why can I why should I just hold you? It's not gonna do any good unless I really understand what this is all about. Because isn't that what love is? Don't you love me? If you love me, you'll talk to me. Because that's really the most important thing in the world. The way that you prove that you love me. If you love me, you'll shut the hell up. <laughs> that was pretty good, Jeff. <laughs> A 
It's a hard one to follow. It's one of those months. <laughs> well, I don't even know where to go. All right. <laughs> but you see, that's, that's part of the juxtaposition between thoughts and feelings. Jeff and I have termed, I don't know, maybe it's your word, ast astromatopoeia. Yeah. You know, it's an onomatopoeia is a word like kapow. It sound, and often astromatopoeia is we're talking about an aspect and we find that we've just acted out that aspect without even realizing it. Right, which, which also then makes it harder to talk. Well, what, what's happening now though is that, is that Mars is moving into this opposition with Uranus. Remember Mars squared Pluto and now is moving into this opposition with Uranus which can be very explosive in a relationship sense or expressive there's real action here and we're also moving day by day closer to the new moon in cancer yeah so on the the 25th of june active mars again in libra white glove perfectly shiny straight teeth opposes uranus and they start sticking needles into its body that that mars the action planet in opposition to uranus is about breaking the rules Uranus is freedom. Uranus is the first planet outside the bounds of Saturn, the planet of rules. So the challenge of June 25th, and you can give that two days before, two days after, sure. can be this restless, explosive, I want to act, Mars, but I don't know where to put it. It's a little chaotic, it's a little crazy. And so the downside is being accident prone and explosive and blowing stuff up. The positive or a positive expression of it is experimentation. Well, and doing things differently. And I think here there's another point I want to make about this, and that is that when you have an active planet like Mars opposite a an active planet like Uranus, it there is energetic there is energy to express. Often what happens, and astrologers are very guilty of seeing this aspect and saying, this is accident prone, you better be careful and don't drive fast and, be, and don't do, and you know. The fact is that the energy needs to express. And the more you hold it in, repress it, suppress it, bury it, hold it back, it's like you're extending this invisible lightning rod up to Uranus to say, Houston, we got a problem. <laughs> You know, because the lightning, the question is, would you rather be the lightning or be struck by the lightning? I always think of, I had a client a number of years ago who on a Mars-Uranus conjunction broke his leg stepping off the third rung of the ladder painting because he forgot he was on the ladder. Um, and did I say he had a really bad argument with his wife that morning and he was really pissed. And he had got himself into a kind of an emotional tizzy and he was probably not thinking and just stepped down. You see what happens with Mars Uranus is that because sometimes we're afraid of, of blowing the shit up that Jeff talked about. We're afraid of, uh, of stirring up issues that we suppress or we're, we repress it, we hold the energy in and when we do it c then c comes to us in the form of a projection. Uh, I had a client who had a Mars Uranus conjunction, a Ur Mars Uranus opposition in relationship houses, and this woman had a string of guys who left her by leaving notes on refrigerators. <laughs> and, and, and it turns out that the issue really was that she was a lot crazier than she acted. <laughs> but she pretended she wasn't, so she had relationships with people who were so crazy that they could remind her of how crazy that she was, but she wouldn't own her own stuff. And when we don't own our own stuff, especially in an opposition, it can get to us. Yeah, that, that's well put. And it's all about projection. The opposition is an angle of projection when we don't own our stuff, as Rick put it. Um, do something that's freeing for yourself. Rather than rebelling against external authority or somebody else's rules, do something innovative and creative in breaking free of your own unnecessary rules. That would be a good way to spend it. New moon. And then, on the 27th of June, we have a new moon in Cancer. And the new moon is a seed point where the conscious day force of the sun and the instinctive night force of the moon come together and begin a period of conception. And Cancer is the mother sign, the family sign, the nourishment sign, this new moon is very, very fertile. The feelings, the ideas, and the activities that begin at that time 
have, a, I think, a, a strong potential to take root. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because a new moon is the beginning of, of a cycle, but it's also the ending of the cycle prior to it. And the cycle prior to it was that new moon in Gemini square to, to Neptune, and this new moon in Cancer, again, feeling, feeling. Remember I said that I felt that a lot of this month was really about a transition um, from, from, from starting things and doing things and from thinking about things, air and cardinal signs, into water. Well, here we have a new moon in water, and rather than squaring Neptune, what's this doing? It's saying now the dreams can settle in in a way that are actually positive rather than just disruptive or dis. Neptune can be disillusioning and Neptune can be deceptive. Here, with Neptune harmonizing with this, it's like the dream, to quote a friend of ours, Caroline Casey, uh, dreams or imagination lays the tracks for the reality train to follow. And that's what's going on here. We're also at the very tail end of the Mercury retrograde. It turns direct on July 1st. And so even that, it back in thinking Gemini is then over the next monthly cycle that this is starting, is then moving back into Gemini. I mean, sorry, back into Cancer. Yeah, and I want to bring up another thing. I, I said that Cancer is a sign of the family. Neptune is a planet of forgiveness. And forgiveness is not about forgetting. It's putting things in such a large context that there's some understanding and the toxicity of pain is sufficiently diluted to no longer be hurtful. Cancer is memory and family in the past, but it's a new moon. This is a new start with your own personal history. And for many of us, in our own understanding of the impact that our family of origin has had upon us, and that forgiving them is not about letting anybody else off the hook. It's about freeing yourself from holding that hook of self-limitation and disappointment. And that can, with this particular new moon, be a very sweet letting go of the painful past. All right. Well, that's, that's our presentation. We're going to take, thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Jeff. And if you'd like your chart to...